Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Reardon, Dean of the Daniels College of Business. Welcome to the 2011-2012 Voices of Experience Speaker Series. This series started seven years ago with the hopes that we could bring some of the most talented leaders to come to this community to talk to us about the big issues of the day. We want to talk about ethics, we want to talk about the economy, we want to talk about sustainability. Our series this year is going to prove to be just that. We have thought leaders and we have some of the most prominent leaders in their industry. Tonight, as you know, we start the series with the CEO of Visa and the CEO of U.S. Bancorp. We're going to continue the series in October and November with the CEO of REI and the CEO of Crocs. In the spring, we're going to continue with the CEO of DeVita and the CFO of Home Depot. How does that sound for a series? Pretty good, huh? Yeah. These leaders are very generous with this time, their time, but this series could not be made possible without also the generous support of many of our sponsors, whom I'd like to acknowledge now. Our financial sponsors include Grant Thornton, First Bank, CoBank, and Hamilton, Fotts, and Waller. Let's please give them a round of recognition. We also have several in-kind sponsors, Chase, Rocky Mountain Human Resource People and Society, National Association of Corporate Directors, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, Net Impact, the Daniels Marketing Roundtable, and Three Tomatoes Catering. Thank you to our in-kind sponsors as well. So as you know, ethics is the hallmark of the Daniels College of Business and certainly at the University of Denver. And I'm very proud to announce tonight our latest ranking by the Aspen Institute Beyond Gray Pinstripes. We are number 15 in the world for our focus on ethics and sustainability. To give you some perspective, there are over 13,000 business schools worldwide and 3,600 here in the United States alone. So we're very proud of that focus. Number two, by Business Week and Ethics as well here in the United States, a big issue that we all need to be focused on. One of the things that I've been doing recently is interviewing executives from around the country about the big issues that they're facing and what they're thinking about as we move forward in today's world. You couldn't have imagined the business environment that we have today three years ago. These executives are talking about the challenges that they've been facing and the issues that they've been dealing with, and most importantly, they're thinking about the issues that we need to be considering as we move forward. Tonight, I think we're going to have an example of this from our two speakers. Joe Saunders and Richard Davis are thought leaders in their industry. They're definitely thinking big, and they're thinking boldly about how we move forward in the financial services industry. I'd like to take a moment to talk a little bit about Richard Davis. Most importantly, he's the parent of a University of Denver student, and he has also a daughter-in-law who's a University of Denver student or alum, and they have a grandchild that we hope will also be a University of Denver pioneer. No pressure, Richard. But he started in the banking industry when he was just 18 years old, and he has now become the CEO and chairman and president, all three titles, of U.S. Bank Corps. This is the, they hold the fifth largest commercial bank here in the United States. If you watch any of the press, they're one of the most highly regarded banks to exist here in the United States alone. Take a look at Richard's thought leadership for a moment. We are joined now for an exclusive interview by one of those CEOs, Richard Davis. He is chairman, president, and CEO of U.S. Bank Corp. Mr. Davis, great to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, the impression that Americans got last night listening to the president was that he was mad. He was upset that you guys weren't doing enough to get all that cash from the taxpayer, from the Federal Reserve, out to small businesses in particular. Was he also angry? Did he appear to be angry at you today? And was that the message that you heard? David, it was a very productive meeting, and uh, we know what he said last night, and he reminded us in the beginning that he's speaking on behalf of the American people, that, and it's not surprising to us. This is an industry that was uh, given the ability to have taxpayer money last year. Some of us have paid it back. Some are still in the process. And I think the quid pro quo that the American people is, why don't you do more lending, and what can you do to help with this recovery? So he was very clear on those uh, key tenants. He was very firm on expecting us to step up and become even more engaged in the recovery and taking and showing more leadership and making sure that consumers and small businesses have lending. 
that housing modifications occur, and that regulatory reform is something that we're supporting and working toward a solution as opposed to fighting it. Uh, Mr. Davis, you sound very, um, very much in agreement with the president as, as you speak to us, but right. if you were sitting in a room with John Mack of Morgan Stanley and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs and there were no politicians around, would you be raising your eyes saying, please, would these guys stop forcing us to do this? I mean, I, I'm just interested to know if you feel that that is the sure. correct path to start lending more in this atmosphere. Well, you know, Liz, uh, actually, I was in a room with those guys, and, and in fact, they were on the telephone. But uh, we are in absolute agreement that we need to find a way to help this recovery, and the banks are going to be at the centerpiece of that. Uh, let me start by reminding you that the, the coal to our engine, effectively, is lending. It's what banks do. So our motivations to lend are very high. Um, secondly, it's not unconsequential to note that at the end of a recession or at the beginning of a recovery, the very people who need the loan the most are probably under the most stressed circumstances. So it's our job to make sure we find a way to make loans to qualified people. What we promised today was not that we would change the underwriting rules, but that we would do a better job of trying to find a way to make loans that are doable. We were promised and committed to a second look program on all business loans that are turned down so that small business consumers and uh, advocates have a place to go in case there's a loan that we say no to and we should look harder at. We also agreed to look at the SBA programs and provide guidance to the administration on ways to improve some of the tenants of those programs and to improve the way consumers and small business owners can get to them. They're very complicated, sometimes they're very hard to work through, and we haven't done a very good job as an industry to make that simpler. Are you concerned that politicians who might be frustrated at the pace of your lending will try to somehow force your hand to make you do loans that you think are imprudent? That's a great question, David, and I'll tell you what, I don't think anyone would or should force the hands of banks to do anything imprudent. And our shareholders and our boards of directors and your CEOs won't let that happen. But we certainly do have to find a way to become more relevant in this recovery. And I do think lending at the top of mind is something that has to be the most important thing we focus on. So one of the outcomes today was that the CEOs directly, uh, without the proxy of just working through trade associations or lobbying groups or even some of our own employees, have committed to working with the president's team to figure out ways to directly improve lending and to find ways to become more relevant in the next couple of months as the critical juncture of this recovery begins. So I think a lot was accomplished, not the least of which was our personal commitment to become directly involved in some of the solutions. Well, I love the tone you're taking, and I think it's really important for Americans to hear this, but last night, you know, on 60 Minutes, the president said, gee, why do people feel anger toward the bankers? Let's see, they got us into this mess, they needed our money to help them out, and now within the blink of an eye, it seems, on the geologic time lapse, they're already giving right. 10 to $20 million bonuses. Do you understand that sort of anger, that populist feeling, uh, uh, how people feel about this, in that many people who never ever even bought a derivative or ever heard of a credit default swap had to bail the banks out? Liz, I completely understand it, and I think my peers do as well. Let's dimension, though, first, there are 8,075 banks in the country, and the vast majority of them, the vast majority, neither use the TARP money and certainly don't have executive compensation issues that anyone would take a, a, take a, a, a conflict with. So in many cases, we are dealing with a very small minority of high-profile headline companies, and we're not surprised by that either. Um, in some cases, most of our banks, I represent one, we don't have any trading employees, we don't have anyone who deals with those high compensation levels, and yet those few that do, um, you have to appreciate the global aspect of those jobs and the competitive nature of it, and we're not surprised that that has a sound bite that's very unattractive. But understand this. We all received a lot of taxpayer support, not just through the TARP money, but in many cases, great programs that were developed that were very instrumental to saving this economy. We understand that. We do have to find a way to provide back whatever we can to be the catalyst of this recovery, and it starts with lending, it ends with lending, and we want to make loans. We simply have to find a way at this very difficult time to qualify more people and show our best efforts to be thankful for what we were given some uh, 12 or 16 months ago. So we're going to work harder at that. And the most important part of this meeting was to agree with the president and his team that the CEOs will step up and become more directly active in some of those solutions, and I think that's going to yield some very good results. When we dug down into the figures, the Goldman Sachs figures, their last quarter results, as I'm sure you know, were spectacular, and we noted that they were making money on betting against the dollar in currency trades, on uh, junk bonds, buying junk bonds, on doing a lot of the things uh, that frankly Americans weren't too happy about and send it, instead of sending money to the small businesses and mid-sized companies. Uh, where are you making your money now? How does, where is your money coming in from? 
Yeah, David, a U.S. bank, for instance, is a more proxy for the more average bank. We're a classic old-fashioned bank. We collect deposits and we make loans on those deposits. We don't get in some of the complicated international businesses. And those who do are very good at it, and I'm not going to speak to that. But the rest of us make money on loans. Um, you give us a dollar of a deposit, and the average bank can turn that around seven times and lend it out. It's a great business, and that's where the leverage comes in the recovery of this economy. So you want us to do that with those deposits and make loans. We simply have to have qualified loans. And as popular as it might be to make loans now at a lower level quality to get things going, no one, not in that room or anyone else, would disagree that you don't want us to do that out of the fear that the unintended consequences of the future would be more loan defaults and more problems. So we've got to find that balance, and this is where the CEOs are going to step in and take a direct action in making sure those solutions are made. So we are in for a treat tonight, wouldn't you say? Richard is often called to Washington, D.C. to talk with Obama and talk about the big issues facing the financial services industry. Last year, he was named Banker of the Year by the Bankers Association and also Executive of the Year by the Twin, Business, Twin Cities Business Journal. Please join me in welcoming Richard Davis to the stage. I don't remember. Thank you. I don't remember it. So I have to ask this next question. How many of us have visas in our wallets? I think the entire audience. So our next speaker is Joe Saunders. And I'm very proud to say that he is also an alum of the Daniels College of Business with both an undergraduate business degree and an MBA. He also has a son that graduated from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. More importantly, though, Joe has been CEO and chairman of Visa since 2007 and took it through its largest, the nation's largest, IPO at $17.9 billion. Take a look at what's happening at Visa. Fifty years. A lot has happened in the last half century. The world has changed. People have changed. We've gone from local to global, from analog to digital, from impossible to everyday. And right at the center of it all, that's where you'll find us. Because for 50 years, Visa's been helping people do things both ordinary and extraordinary to make the most of their lives on their own terms. And it all started with a single vision. In the summer of 1958, in the sleepy farming community of Fresno, California, the Bank of America introduced a revolutionary experiment, the Bank AmeriCard. A simple paper card accepted at local stores with a credit limit of $300, the Bank AmeriCard was the first credit card for the average American. The cashless revolution had begun. The Bank AmeriCard changed everything. Soon the little card made its way into the wallets of more and more people throughout California, then the whole country. But could it go further? One man thought so. They asked me what I thought we ought to do, and I said, well, I think a very small number of people ought to go away isolate themselves from everything and address one question. If anything in the world is possible, what would be an ideal organization to create the world's premier system for the exchange of value? The new organization was a stroke of genius. Banks became partners with a unified vision. Hawk then introduced the world's first electronic authorization system for faster transactions and less fraud. Bank AmeriCard's success spread across the nation and ultimately the world. And our new company would go on to do many more amazing things. And what if money became fully electronic? Well, it would become nothing but electrons and photons that move around this world at the speed of light at minuscule cost.
Visa has changed the way the world's money moves. We've made e-commerce what it is today, and we continue to pioneer new forms of prepaid, money transfer, and mobile solutions. More than anything else, it's our partnerships that have fueled our dramatic growth through the years. Our over 16,000 partner banks help us reach new markets, big and small, while we help them connect with their customers in new and meaningful ways. All of this has allowed us to grow at an increasingly rapid pace as we forge new relationships and continually evolve the ways we do business. In 2008, we took this evolution one step further, transforming from a single association of regional members to a single public company, executing the largest IPO in U.S. history, and putting ourselves in the very best position to continue to serve our bank and merchant partners and the world. In the last 50 years, we've given more people in more places more ways to pay and the freedom and power to improve their lives. But there's still much more opportunity out there more chances to move people's everyday purchases from cash and checks to Visa. And more growing economies, which will bring billions of new unbanked consumers into the financial system, so more people can benefit from what Visa has to offer. So as we look toward the future, we remember how we started, as a simple idea to give people a better form of payment and make their lives a little better, which in turn drives us to make Visa better as well. Visa is an archetype of organizations of the future, way, way ahead of its time. I can only repeat the last words I said to the board at Visa when I left. I simply said, I've done the best I can, now let those who can do better. Joe Saunders has been taking Visa to new heights for the last four years. Their technology strategy is astounding. We're going to see things that we never could have imagined coming from that organization. There were a lot of firsts up there from Visa, and I'm very pleased tonight to have Joe and Richard as our first speakers for the Voices of Experience series. Please join me in welcoming the chairman and CEO and the Daniels pioneer, Joe Saunders. Hi, Joe. Pretty exciting stuff. He has all the fun stuff. I just realized that. Yeah. I was going to play your I was going to play yes, your video sir. with I can see clearly now, but I was going to make you sing. That would have worked for me. Yeah, yeah. I was going to make you sing. So, Richard, you have such a highly regarded organization, fifth largest commercial bank here in the United States. You have over 3,000 branches in 25 um, states, and so. Really, what is your strategy going forward? As we look at some of the issues that are facing the financial services today, what are some of the strategies that you're going to be using to grow and to develop? It's not going to be very provocative, but it's, it's important, and it's building trust again. Um, banking's about 150 years old, and if there's anything we all spend time, the collection of bank CEOs, it's to rebuild the trust that particularly the American people need to have in banks. If you go back to the old days, a few of us in this room can remember the, uh, the TV show Bonanza, the rest of you will tell you about it later. But in those old days, there was a, you know, a very basic town in the Western civilization, and there was a saloon and a hotel, and there was a, a jail and a general store, and there was always a bank. And there was a bank because it was kind of the beginning of the bartering of people who needed a place for their safekeeping. They could trust it. And people who had a dream to, to fulfill, they could come and get money because they were trusted. 
And somewhere along the line, we've confused that. We've made this all very complicated. And as much as I want to get into some of the details about the world that we're in, if we can stay to those basic tenets of being true and trustworthy, we've got something going for us. And that's what we have to build back. Terrific. Now, Joe, what is the relationship of Visa with U.S. Bancorp? One, one of our most valued clients. He loves good me, man. Good answer. I, I mean, I love U.S. Bank. Uh, actually, uh, uh, they are one of our most valued clients. Uh, Richard and I served on the Visa board together prior to the uh, merger. As a matter of fact, it was Richard who called me and uh, asked me to take this job in the first place. I did. So. Uh, We've known each other for a long, long time. I think I, I, think I was on the board since 2001, and, uh, um, and it's, a, uh, it's a good relationship. What's interesting to know, if I can jump in, Visa doesn't make the loans. They're, they're not a balance sheet, so they move the money. You need a bank like ours and all the companies that brand with them, but we're very careful about who we put our name next to, and one of the best reasons that we're here tonight is because the trust I have for this guy and for the brand of that company is unparalleled, and I hope it's the same for him. So let's talk about partnerships for a moment. Certainly in your video, Joe, they talked a lot about growing your organization through partnerships. And as we look at where we go globally, partnerships are going to be key. And Richard, you certainly acquire banks through your partnerships. What is the role of partnerships in your strategy going forward, and how are you going to continue to develop those? We can't uh, do everything on our own. We can't develop the payment system independently around the world. And so we enter into partnerships uh, when it furthers, uh, it furthers our objective and our partner's objective. Uh, in fact, uh, two of the most recent and significant partnerships we have are with U.S. Bank, a, a venture called Sincata, which is a global uh, international uh, payments <coughs> uh, partnership, and uh, a partnership uh, with Avalon, which is their uh, processing uh, platform to uh, start an acquiring business with the State Bank of uh, India. So what are we going to see in the world of technology and, and you know, paperless financial payments going forward? Well, you know, it's, it, it, that, that's an interesting question. If you look at what we, uh, years ago, and I wasn't around 50 years ago when d -Hox Well, you were around. <laughs> And I was very... He, Come he was on, you're not kidding anybody he here, Joe. I was very... I didn't have a credit card. Nice card. Yeah, you didn't have a credit card. Uh, but uh, the industry's gone through an incredible transformation. Uh, and even if you look at the, last 20, uh, at the last 20 years, the nature of it has consistently changed. And so while it's changing in may, what may be the most volatile uh, way that it ever has, it, it's still an extension of the change that has been occurring almost since, uh, almost since the electronic payments uh, came into being. And obviously, the underpinning, uh, the underpinning right now is the movement to mobile technology and the uh, advantages that mobile technology bring to uh, uh, an electronic payment structure. It is, it's an incredibly useful tool in emerging economies. Uh, because emer in emerging economies, uh, the, the geographies are just not amenable to landlines and to terminalization, and so mobile phone becomes a terminal. It is, a, uh, it is useful for the unbanked and uh, the underbanked, uh, even in the United States. It's useful in delivering government uh, benefits. It is useful because more people have mobile phones than have bank accounts, than have credit cards that have almost anything else, and therefore it is convenient and useful even to sophisticated users in uh, very uh, mature uh, environments. Uh, the notion uh, that you will walk around with a cell phone and that it will be ubiquitous and be everything to everybody and that you'll be able to use it in every merchant uh, that you walk into is still a ways, uh, it's still a ways off. But uh, the uses for the card uh, are multiplying uh, exponentially and uh, we are, we're in the middle of a, of a revolution. And so at these ends, we need to toggle between what is and what needs to continue while something else uh, uh, transitions. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's an incredible transformation. Uh, 
we just bought a company uh, a few months ago called PlaySpan. And this is the company that allows you, uh, as um, silly or as small as it may sound, to buy little $1 items that you all buy to play games on mobile phones that I don't necessarily play. Angry Birds, for sure. <laughs> More than I don't, at, at least I don't play them until my son teaches me what they are and how to play them. And then I do. Uh, but uh, w the, the fact that you're able to buy something in real time on a mobile phone is, is just an indicator of, uh, the, uh, of things that are to come. I think that you'll see in the not too distant future the same ability to buy things on the internet with ease off of a mobile phone that you can off of the internet. And I think you'll see both the internet and uh, the mobile phone applications become uh, considerably more simple, more of a, uh, uh, although there are one-click environments around, I think you're going to see a more ubiquitous environment where you can get a uh, single click with an alias and capability to keep what you do private and convenient, and that really is uh, what it's all about. I was in a Starbucks and then it showed up because you talked you just, about it. You, 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 know, you just twice. talked a lot longer. You didn't know how to spell ubiquitous, but you so, used it twice. I think that's I know, I did. Any word that is longer Complicated. than six letters, I use more than once. <laughs> in front of smart people. If I know the word. Right. Uh, 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 I was just in a Starbucks this morning and watching, uh, watching a number of people use their cell phone uh, to purchase coffee. So I think um, it's, uh, it's here to stay. So the Great. real test for your technology people is whether Joe can use it, whether he sure makes it, makes it to the product if I can line. Use it, it definitely is in the mainstream. Yeah. So next time you come to speak, I need to ask how many people have the Visa app on their mobile phone That's versus it. how many people have the yeah, Visa so card last, in their you're, wallet. You're so 2010. Yes, I am absolutely. I am absolutely. So um, let's talk a little bit about an issue that certainly has been weighing on people's minds for the last three years with the financial and economic crisis. And certainly, Richard, you've been one of the thought leaders that have been invited to Washington to talk about the financial situation. I thought the video was really compelling when it discussed bankers are hated, and then we also rely on them for much of our daily lives in terms of the financial payments and also keeping our money safe. Um, we've got a number of different acts that are out there. Certainly the Credit Card Act, and we've got the Durban, Durban Amendment, we've got the Dodd-Frank Act. What are some of the issues that you think are really coming out of that that impact your business the most? I mean, certainly all of it does, but what are the big ones that you're dealing sure. with? There's two things. One is consistent with what I said earlier. If you pull the thread on every one of those acts or initiatives or laws, it's back to trying to get balance again with people not getting mistreated. People knowing what they're buying, understanding what they have, knowing how to improve their lives by using it the way they're supposed to, not forgetting to ask the right question or finding a way to get harmed by using it. So at the tenet of is good intentions all across the board. The problem is the execution of some of those activities causes, in some cases, an overswing. The pendulum would swing. And so some of these activities have actually harmed what was never intended to be some of the good parts of what banking does, which is the trust and the provision of access to money and is trying to, in fact, solve too many things. I'll give you an example. The Durban Amendment, for those of you here who don't know, it's a requirement for the banks to reduce the amount of money that we collect when we move a transaction using visas a bug. So if you go into a Starbucks and you use your card or your phone and you swipe it, we read that, we use the visa railroad to carry the transaction over, and we charge a fee for that. And so what Durban wanted was the fee to be substantially less. At the end of the day, that's, we're going to deal with that and we'll make it happen. It probably has nothing to do with the global downturn of the recession of the last three years. In fact, it has nothing to do with it. But it seemed to have a lot of fervor at the moment in time because right then and there, banks were just kind of the victim of everything bad. Another problem we have to deal with. So number one, it was trying to fix the wrongs. And I'm not surprised by that, and that's something that we're going to work on. But the other one, Chris, is really that it was also trying to um, take risk out of banking. And this is where I will take a little risk, pun intended. Um, the risk in banking is so important you understand, that's all we do. We don't make it, we don't break it, we don't fix it, we don't paint it, we don't relocate it, we don't design it, we don't create it. We get behind people who do. And when we do that, we're taking a risk judgment. Mm -hmm. Our risk needs to be, our batting average has to be 98.7% or we're out of business. If we're wrong, more than 1.3% of the times on the loans we give. 
And so the result of that, we need to be good risk managers. Risk, take in your money, protect it, and then lend it out to someone else. There's a thing called leverage, seven to one in our case. You give us a dollar at US Bank of a good deposit, we can make seven dollars in loans. It's wonderful leverage. It's also very protected. So Durban and all these Dodd-Frank initiatives were created to take the leverage down, which is fine, but should it be successful to overswing and take risk out of banking? Honestly, there will be no banking because that's all we do. You need us to be there to create the leverage when the opportunity, when the right people don't have the money who have the dream. And so I'm not surprised by any of it, but it's going to be quite a long trip to get both that reputation back, to earn the trust of the people in it, and to not lose our investors along the way. Because today somebody said, I want to buy a $25 share of U.S. bank stock for my two-year-old grandson who one day will go to DU and I want to put him through college. If they're going to pick U U.S. Bank over another bank, that was my number one concern three years ago. Now it's whether they pick U.S. Bank or any bank instead of picking a pharmaceutical company or a grocery company or a retailer. And therein lies the risk. If we overperform, we'll take the very core of what banking does, the very essence, and we'll put it to the side. So there's a really good article in the Denver Business Journal this past week that talked about the tougher capital standards being tied directly to the inability to grow jobs. What's your take on that? It's overrated. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if we have to hold capital, capital for us is basically the absorption in case there's another problem. Banks that failed in the last three to five years failed because of a liquidity. They didn't have enough money to gather when customers came in, basically had to run on the bank. That's what you found around the globe. Capital is just the absorption. When a banker says that higher capital to a high enough level to give you the protection as an investor and as a consumer um, stops us from making loans, that's just not true. And that clip you gave, which, which is a, a little bit dated, mm -hmm. it's still the issue is present. We, we only make money to make loans. So there's nobody not making a loan that's qualified. We're simply trying to find more people that are qualified. And you don't want us, as much as it may sound right, to take angel investments or get into micro lending for ideas that haven't been tested. You don't want us to do that because we're taking your deposit money and putting it in this 98.7% perfect formula and it would be a mistake today found out a couple of years from now. So we'll find a way to manage through this, but it's a very difficult time. And when people want us to do more lending, it's not because of capital. That's really not the right reason to preclude it. You simply don't want us to be over safe such that we could actually not be able to return to our shareholders and therefore make loans to somebody. And your organization has certainly had a great track record of risk management. Now, um, there has also been some talk that with some of the largest banks here in the United States that they may have difficulty growing with the 10% cap. Do you believe in that as well, or can you talk a little bit about that issue? Well, on one hand, I'm not at the 10% cap, so of course it's a brilliant idea. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, cap on the other in hand, terms of how much assets you can it's, hold. It's yeah, percentage of deposits, actually, that you can have of American deposits. The fact is, you all want us to have very large banks because we're competing with the largest banks in France, the largest banks in Japan, the largest banks in China, the largest banks in Canada, which are really mm -hmm. six large banks. And so if you want us to be, this country to be making loans to Fortune 50 companies, global leaders, you need to have banks with those kinds of balance sheets in order to keep the money and to keep the leadership here in America. And so I can go on a lot of details, but it's really important we have large banks because the global landscape says we need to be at parity with the others. You also want small banks. There are 8,000 banks in America. 20 years from now, there will be 8,000 banks in America. It's, it's America. It's, you can start something up. It's entrepreneurship, and little towns and big cities need them. So when are you going to hit the cap? Um, I don't care if I ever do. It's not okay. a goal to get bigger, just better. Just and better. it'll be a long time, not in my life, to even when we hit the cap. Very good. Now, Joe, certainly um, I've been sitting recently with some executives from an insurance organization and their lawyers as they're going through the Dodd-Frank Act. So a number of financial service organizations are impacted by the government regulation, not just the main banks. How, is, how are all these regulations impacting your business? Well, <clears throat> uh, there's, two, uh, there's two primary uh, uh, legislative actions that have affected uh, Visa. One is the CARD Act which were all of the regulations around uh, the credit card industry, and they affect us because, frankly, uh, we move money between merchants and financial institutions, and the financial institutions deal with the, con uh, with the consumer, uh, not Visa. So when there are things that are done that uh, put a damper on the growth of a business or on a business, uh, uh, then that uh, affects us because it affects the volume that goes through our network. Uh, having said that, I don't think that Richard would disagree at all uh, that there were abuses in the system and there were things that needed to be done. Uh, 
as it related to uh, uh, credit card practices, and they, and they should have been done. I'm not a banker, so I can go a little bit further than I think that he might, but I can tell you that I think that they probably went too far. And the problem with overregulation is that when you take a wrong and you try to correct it, in, in correcting it, you create other mistakes. You, you're not really helping the situation. And without going into a lot of detail, I can just, uh, I can assure you that in some cases, it has restricted lending to individuals and it has limited what financial institutions are willing to do and it has limited the utility to, uh, uh, to consumers. I, I think part of that will be changed over some period of time. I don't think anybody gets anything perfect uh, the first time. The second thing, of course, that has affected us uh, tremendously is the uh, Durban Amendment that um, Richard talked a little bit about. Uh, the Durban Amendment, uh, and once again, I'm not a banker, so uh, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to say what I've said before. It's, it's a classic misapplication of uh, government regulation. It smacks of favoritism, and it is, it, it is anti-capitalistic to its core. You're taking a business that has existed for many, many years, and has a number of contractual relationships that have been built over a period of time that has been accepted by everybody in the value chain uh, that has brought tremendous utility not only to consumers but to the retail community as well as the financial services community. And one day somebody comes in and says, you know what, you're making too much money doing this and I'm just going to take half of what you're making but, and they wanted to take three quarters, and we're talking about <clears throat> we're talking about a pool of about eighteen billion dollars. So we're going to take about thirteen billion of those dollars originally, and we're going to give them to the retail community. There is no requirement that a retailer pass that those savings back to individuals. There's nothing about that. Uh, at all, and then, a series, and then a series of things happen that mitigate it to a certain extent, but it is, uh, it is, uh, it is drastically hurting uh, the profitability of a number of, of every financial institution, including small banks and credit unions, and it will take some under, and uh, it will reduce the desire of financial institutions to continue to provide debit services uh, to individuals in the proactive way uh, that has been done uh, up to now. And, uh, Can I jump in on that? Sir, yeah. feel free. Move your mic because it keeps rubbing against the uh, tie. It's driving me nuts. Um, I like that. My heartbeat. Um, the, I'll fix you talk. I'll fix them. Well, no, they're not going to listen to me. They're going to watch you. It's all about me right now. Um, he broke our mic. The issue, you guys, is he talked about favoritism, moving money from the banks to the um, merchants. But what it really is, it's price fixing. Here I go. I hope the press isn't here, but it's price fixing. And the reason I say this to you is because Joe already established that there was a complete kind of universe of, of parties that agreed that this has got value. And after 50 years, we just saw it. And it'd be like somebody coming into the dairy industry and saying, milk is just too expensive. I don't care how much it hurts you, it should be 50% as expensive. That's never happened. And I want to dovetail this because I said it in my earlier comments, but I think it deserves mm -hmm. emphasis. Dick Durbin from Illinois saw a moment in the middle of all the noise around the Dodd-Frank activities trying to bring some order to the global recession and get banks back in line to do better things, which is a good intent and decided on a Thursday afternoon, 4.45 Central Time, by the way, one day notice, and got 100 senators to come in and vote on something that many of them would agree with right now They didn't know what they were voting for, because he found a window to get something done that he wanted done when it had nothing to do with the bigger issue. And he gave it to the Federal Reserve, which is not typically the overseer of those kinds of decisions, and forced them to make a decision. So there's so many tenants around that, which, which represent really some of the really bad actions that happened in this period of time that will be looked upon as some of the mistakes gone too far. 
Uh, we'll balance it, we'll figure it out, but it's certainly one of the issues that's agitating because it didn't fit all the prescribed ways to do business and to do it not ethically so much, but is at least uh, procedurally. Mm -hmm. I don't think we quite know the impact of that act Not yet. yet. I think don't as yet. they start to roll it out, it we're going to see even more. Actually, mm -hmm. so. I, I, I want to. I'd like to add one thing. There's a second part to that. Uh, is my microphone okay? That's perfect. Is he better? <laughs> Let's give him a round. <laughs> well, you you do that on purpose because then nobody is sure what you really said. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to take. You don't have to take. That way, the press so. aren't taking yeah, copious exactly. notes, right? Uh, <clears throat> but there's a, um, uh, there is a part of the amendment which was uh, directly uh, aimed at Visa, which is routing and exclusivity, which suggests that you have to have more than one network bug on the back of a debit card and uh, that you cannot exclusively have the front of the card and the back of the card just go through the same uh, network. So to the extent that we've built relationships over the years of where that's the case and where you walk into a store with a Visa card and you think that it is a Visa transaction that you're affecting, you actually may not be because it also gives the right to the merchant to decide what network to route the transaction over. And so when you think of all the things that we, uh, we have done over the years to make these transactions uh, safer, to make them more reliable. I won't, I don't think we've made them ubiquitous, but. You tried to find a way to use that again, didn't you? But I got it in three times. You did, three times. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, 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 uh, it, it makes us rethink who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it and whether the investments that we've made to bring the process to where it is today are worth continuing or whether, uh, or whether we're gonna have to ratchet back because uh, we're still in, uh, in business to make. Uh, so what he's saying is regulation can slow innovation, right? That's and right. I think we do in think the, that in this is a case, very regulation is stifling innovation. innovation. Mm -hmm. So, um, Joe, But that's how it's affected us. So certainly it's a different environment than when both of you became the chairman and CEO of your organizations. And, and Joe, you talked a little bit about the regulation impacting the survival of many of the banks. You said credit unions and banks and perhaps even other organizations that are dealing with that. A number of you, both of you have engaged in mergers and acquisitions and we had Howard Schultz, the chairman and CEO of Starbucks in here in April and he talked about the concept of disciplined growth. And then following in May, we had the chairman and CEO of Enterprise Rental Car, Andy Taylor, who also had recently gone through some acquisitions with Alamo um, and National to grow his business. So I'd like to talk for just a moment about how you're gonna move forward given this new environment that we're operating in and talk a little bit about your growth strategies or your acquisition strategies and how you're gonna get better. Um, and specifically, Richard, let's start with you. Uh, certainly, we've seen some consolidations and some acquisitions on your end with banks in certain regions. What role does mergers and acquisitions play in your strategy as you move forward? Mergers and acquisitions for my company will be opportunities not missed, but they will not be strategic. They're not in our plan. This company has got to stand on the feet it's on today. It's got to organically grow and take market share and be more relevant to the people we do business with for the future or we should be out of business. So if an opportunity comes along, meaning a moment in time when it's like a garage sale, somebody wants something and somebody else doesn't and there's always that wonderful match and if that comes along, great. But only because it's better toward your mission and it accomplishes what you want. Bigger is not better. Honestly, it is in fact often not. Better is better and if it contributes to that, so be it. But it's very important. Everyone loves to deal, you guys, everybody. The only good time a, a deal is really evaluated is when the two CEOs are shaking hands and smiling in front of the new wallpaper of both logos. After that, it goes downhill from there. And, 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 and you're messing with a lot of people's lives. It's not to be overlooked. When you are a company that gets bought, uh, it's a very profound issue for you, and you're not sure what your future is going to be. You're with the company that bought, it's a very profound issue for you. You don't know what your future is going to be. So you're messing with a lot of, a lot of people's lives, but you're also messing with your DNA. So I would be very careful to say mergers and acquisitions. First of all, there's no such thing as mergers of equals. There's always a winner, there's always a loser. And, and there's very important to know that it's pretty overrated. Most of them do not prove in the, in the hindsight to have worked. Scale is important, 
and mission is important. But if it doesn't meet both of those and extremely with high certainty, don't do it. So how do you know an opportunity is right for your organization? You study it very hard. You, you work with outside parties that have no vested interest in whether you make that decision. You have a board of directors that gives you 13 very informed voices, not just one, that can give you the guidance. And if it makes sense and if it's all those parameters, those very few parameters, we'll probably do it. But we're not looking for it. We're not calling it out as one of our goals. At least at my company, size has nothing to do with our strategy of being better. So do you use it to move into new areas within the states? I know that you acquired one of the banks, actually, that was owned by one of our alums down in New Mexico. New Mexico, Mexico. great. Mm -hmm. um, first community. So this is a great example. Um, the U.S. Bank is in 24 states. We're in 24 contiguous states. Contiguous, it's like ubiquitous. Continuous, <laughs> contiguous states. And we, had a, we have a, stand, a standing plan. We don't care. Can you if we name have, your 24 contiguous states? I cannot. States. I could, <laughs> if you gave me enough time. Alphabetically, I couldn't. Um, we say we don't care if we're in a 25th state. If there is a 25th state, it needs to be contiguous with the other 24. New Mexico, check. It needs to be a market that we can grow. New Mexico, check. It needs to be a market where we take immediate uh, market position. It's the third largest bank in New Mexico, check. And finally, the people who bank with us might actually value that we're now connected if you're in Arizona or if you're in Colorado, check. And it was an opportunity too good to pass, made by a, an unfortunate situation, the FDIC closing them down, mm -hmm. check, check, check. Mm -hmm. That's why it passed. You should have seen the 25 that didn't pass the test. Well, you won't because we didn't do it. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, everyone in New Mexico speaks very highly of the acquisition. Yeah, Good. absolutely. Check, check, check. Yeah, love them. Check, check, check. <laughs> I don't know if it's ubiquitous, but at least no, it's not ubiquitous. We don't, we're not that <laughs> impressive contiguous. yet. One day, contiguous. Though. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Joe, certainly uh, acquisition has been part of the strategy, uh, or at least something that you've done in the past, because I know you called me one day when we were having a board meeting in Denver and said, I can't make it. We're about to make a $2 million company acquisition. So what are some of the acquisitions? $2 million? Wow, $2 million, that's a big $2 billion? <laughs> I didn't want to give you that much credit. Oh, thank you. So um, certainly you've acquired a number of companies. You mentioned a few of those before. What are some of the big areas in which you will look to acquire companies? Uh, uh, our acquisition strategy uh, is strategic, and it is strategic because of the changing nature of the industry that we're in. So uh, we sat down uh, about two and a half years ago, and remember, we've only been a company for four years, so it was shortly after we put ourselves together and asked, what is the future? What do we have to do to be relevant uh, five years from now or 10 years from now? And uh, what do we have to do not to become a utility? What do we have to do uh, so that we don't get pushed aside? And if you listen to telcos or social networks like Google, uh, they'll, they've actually publicly said, we're going to make Visa irrelevant. You know, we're going to take over their space. And so we did a gap analysis. And we looked at who we were, what we knew how to do, what assets we had, and what we didn't have. And we decided in looking at what we didn't have, what we needed to acquire, what we could build ourselves, and uh, what we were probably best uh, partnering with somebody for. And we have, uh, we have reasonably, methodically gone about the uh, uh, process of filling out that gap analysis. And we're, 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 we're pretty close to being done in, um, uh, in, that, in that regard. Uh, but that the strategic fit to the world of tomorrow is, is everything uh, as it relates to an acquisition from our point of view. Visa traditionally never bought anything. Any technology that Visa had up until the acquisition for all practical purposes was built by Visa. And, uh, and so uh, uh, this required a new mindset and a new thought process. And um, we think that we've done it carefully. Uh, we think that we have considered the integration implications that there always are when you do an, uh, uh, <clears throat> an acquisition. And we think that we have uh, put ourselves in a position to compete in the future by doing what we've done. So two different perspectives. Acquisition is not part of the strategy, and acquisition is part of the strategy. Let's talk about how you handle that organizationally. Do you have a group that's going out and looking for 
um, companies to acquire as part of your gap analysis? And do you have a group that just waits for opportunities to come up, or do you seek out opportunities? How do you have this set up with strategy, not a strategy? We've always had a product development group uh, at Visa, and uh, it has morphed into more of a, a strategic, uh, a strategic group when all of the regulation that I talked about before, and by the way, uh, now that I reigned on uh, the parade of regulation, I want to point out that debit cards are 20% of our business, I mean, 80% of our business is in something else, and uh, our business outside the United States is growing considerably more rapidly than our business in the United States. So strategically, it's technology and globalization. But that's what, that is what drives us, and we separated, functionally separated that from the ongoing day-to-day -day core business, particularly uh, in the United States because of the turmoil that the uh, uh, regulation was causing and because of the length of time that it took to get through it. If, I, if we had allowed one to distract uh, from the other, I, I, we wouldn't be where we, where we are today. So. We do have a fairly discreet group that pays nothing, pays attention to nothing, but trying to understand how do we interact with social networks, what technologies should we be engaging in, and uh, where are we going, particularly outside the United States, uh, with this technology. Our last acquisition was a company called Fundamo in South Africa, and it allows us to take in. in simplified terms, it, it take a Visa prepaid card technology and put it on top of a closed loop system that was started by telcos, because in emerging economies, telcos are the monetary exchange. You pay for utilities with minutes. So this brings utility to the telco that's providing this, the unbanked or the underbanked, and uh, it, uh, it creates um, a better usage framework. It, it, it create it eliminates connectivity problems for the uh, telco. It uh, it is the basis for starting volume to run through uh, the Visa system in a in an unbanked or uh, essentially uh, underbanked. It is uh, what we view as financial inclusion. So ours is like power dating and Facebook. We'll date anyone once, and our status is single. So <laughs> if people want to come and How talk to us. How many friends have liked you, Richard? I have friended a few. Um, it, we will make it clear that we are in certain businesses, and we will reach out to people that are in businesses of smaller scale. And somewhere along the line, let them know that if they're ever interested in, in divesting of that piece of the asset more often than the whole company, yeah. we'd like very much to get a call. And so every Wednesday in my company at 9.15 a.m., we have an investment committee. And the CFO, the general counsel, myself, the chief technology officer, and the chief revenue officer will meet. And anybody can come in, and they can have an acquisition or an organic growth initiative or anything they want to do to build the company well outside of the plans of an annual profit plan and all that. And most of our work is done through those opportunities. So it includes M&A. Due diligence is very important to it an acquisition to go out and learn what you think you knew and confirm what you know. Pricing matters, but it all comes down to relationships, and at the end of the day, two people end up confirming a transaction, and it has to be built on some level of trust. So if you're both building your Facebook profile page for the optimum company to acquire in the situation, what would be the elements of success that go along with the success? A super cool picture. <laughs> 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 One that even looks like you a little bit every once in a while, that helps. Um, it would be, uh, you want somebody to join, you want somebody to want to be part of your company. That's how I feel about it. So if someone says, I know your culture, I know you'll take care of the people that I'm going to hand over to you, I know they'll be in better hands because you've invested more, you have scale, you have a future, I can't do with it what you can. I want them to want to send it to us. I don't want to take something from someone else. It sounds kind of basic, but those don't work very well. And I'll never do a hostile transaction because they almost never work. Okay. How about from you, Joe? Well, I mean, from a Facebook analogy, I suppose, uh, after all the regulatory issues we've had around the world, we just want friends. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We have no friends. <laughs>
put a pump chamber. <laughs> so we want to get to the audience questions, but I, I want to ask you this one last question. So certainly given the challenges that you've both gone through for the last three years, and it's certainly not going to get easier as we move forward, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned from the last three years? And most importantly, what do you think the future business leaders need to be considering as we move forward? Okay, lesson learned. Um, get to know your legislators when you're not asking for something. So we're both in Washington so much, and, and we were certainly there during the Durban, the moments before Durban. We were there kind of lobbying ourselves, not having other people do it for us, saying, this is really not a good thing. Let me explain to you why. And legislators, they're amazing. They're patriots, right? And there's 535 Congress people and 100 senators. And they don't understand these kind of businesses. They're not supposed to. So when we come in and ask them for something, we're, we're confusing the situation. We're now back in full force, just getting to know them and letting them know who we are and not asking for anything. So lesson number one. And lesson number two is keep your employees very, very proud of what they do, who they do it for, and the mission they provide. Uh, the Bonanza thing I opened with, we, we keep that pretty close to, the, to our heart at the bank. We don't want to get this too complicated. And I want the employees in any bank to feel really proud of what they do. It's a very noble thing we're doing. And if they start to believe what has been said about all the banks and start to feel a little loss of confidence or belief in what their mission is, then we'll find ourselves in harm's way. I think we lost that as an industry. We're working that back. So lessons learned. And I will add, the three years we've been through may well replicate another mm -hmm. three. So we, it's good lessons to learn at halftime here to go back out in the second half and be a little better. Mm -hmm. I've heard that from other executives. How about from you, Joe? Well, I have to reiterate his first uh, two messages because we've been involved in right. much of the same thing that uh, he has. I think it's, uh, it's important when you're in an industry that's changing as rapidly as the one that we are in, uh, that's transforming. Uh, it is that the senior management of the company is informed about what each other are doing and what's important to each other, that things are brought uh, to the table when there's time to have a discussion about it and time to do something about it until, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of when it's too late. And uh, when you're in 165 countries and uh, running uh, the number of businesses that we are around the world, that's not a simple thing to do but it's an extraordinarily important thing to do. We all have to be focused on the same thing. We have to understand what our strengths are. We have to act on what we know we know how to do, and we have to turn away, as Richard talked about uh, from an acquisition point of view, from things that are just things to do and not things that add uh, to who we are. And we need to collectively understand that. Very good. You ready to hear what the audience is thinking? Sure. So how about if we um, give a, a round of applause for the first, not for them. The first half. No, no, no. The round of applause is going to go to the first audience member that can use ubiquitous in their question. Or contiguous. Or contiguous. Or contiguous. That's right. All or right. Both. Let's take questions. That's a twofer. There's one over here. So fears in the global economy and the banking system appear to be ubiquitous today and most recently. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, that's close. Uh, so so tell, tell us a little bit, uh, Richard, from your perspective and yours as well, kind of what, what fear you see and what's going on in Europe right now and, and the, tra the trajectory of that crisis and the, and the folks that are working on it. Um, could you see an impact to the United States banking system? Sure. Uh, pervasive, Mike be a good way to say that. Um, look, it's, it's the real deal. I'll just start right at the end. Uh, the, the, the connectedness of this world that we're in is real. And it's probably overstated um, right now. There was a day two weeks ago when China said they might come in and help Italy. And on that very day, my company, which is worth $45 billion, lost and made a billion dollars before the market closed on that rumor of something China might do for a country called Italy. And I'm really not in either one of them. So the risk is the uncertainty that people have about really what's happening around the globe. But it's a real risk. So the risk of contagion suggests that we're also connected, that should there be an equivalent of a Lehman Brothers in Europe or somewhere else in the world, what you don't know is if they fall, you don't know if they're pulling anyone with them. 
and it's not in the disclosure rules that, and it wouldn't be appropriate to explain that you do or don't have that risk. So everybody then needs to be believed to be somehow uh, contagious. As a result of that, we need to pay more attention to what's happening around the globe. And while I could agree that there are austerity programs that need to be accomplished and some very heavy lifting done by the regulators and by the, by the, uh, the leaders overseas, um, they, I was in, a, in Washington Friday with a number of my peers around the globe, and they look at us and say, when are you guys going to get your act together, and when are you going to do with your austerity programs, and when are you going to provide the certainty that we all need that if something happened in America, like just getting your debt figured out, that we don't fall overseas. So it's important that we don't just cast aspersions one direction, not realize we're probably glass houses at this point in time. But I will tell you, it's very real, and likewise we are to them. And so we all need to do a better job in the hands and the minds of some very few people, some very smart people like Bernanke and Geithner, who represent our great nation, that they say things they can deliver, that they deliver on what they say, and that they start to enable some of this trust and belief that we'll work together on these issues, which is really what's at the heart of what we're all about is will everybody come to the table at the same time and do it with the right level of integrity and good faith? It's a question. What do you say? Well, I mean, I agree with you, but given, given where we do business, I mean, we are heavily engaged with uh, the governments of Brazil and Argentina and Mexico, uh, uh, Russia, China, Japan, uh, India. I, I mean, we, we, we cannot be in the payments business in a country uh, without engaging within that, in that country. We pay people uh, in different currencies all over the world, so what's happening in one place affects, uh, affects our uh, company uh, in any one of a, a number of ways. But over half of our revenues within the next uh, year, year and a half, will be from outside the United States, and that is continuing to grow more rapidly than within the United States, so we have a truly uh, global business, and uh, we're dependent on the world operating uh, somewhat, at least somewhat uh, harmoniously. I mean, we have um, we have our second largest um, employee concentration in Singapore. Um, we have offices in well, I mean, I don't. I can't name them all right now, but at any rate, we have a lot of them. A lot of them. But they're not all contiguous. They're not. Yeah. There's they're water not. somewhere between them. Some of them aren't contiguous, though. That's right. I'm sure they are. Question up there? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm going to make a statement of that our educational system does not do a very good job of educating the general public on how to handle debt and use it as a tool. And that you guys basically got punished for legally taking advantage of the lack of education of our public. And what I would like to know is, is there anything that you guys are interested in doing in helping to educate the populace on how to use debt? Yes, first of all. Um, and in the category of, I suppose it's too late now, but that's one of the biggest activities we pursue, um, financial literacy. Uh, we don't benefit by people not understanding how to manage their mortgage, how not to get ripped off by somebody who's going to come in and try to hurt them in their, uh, uh, in their warranty process by having people overdraw their checking accounts or extend themselves over their credit line. Um, the problem is, as many employees as we have that are out there, and each employee on average probably does about 10 hours of some kind of social service in the community, most of which is financial literacy, it's barely moving the needle. And so having been, uh, as I say, an invitee to a number of meetings in Washington not long ago, this issue came up, and uh, it was a dinner at the Fed, which means to say it was not very good food, it was, it was not there for, the, for the, uh, uh, the fun, but we were asked to talk about financial literacy, and, and I'll just tell you what my answer was, and it was that the only way to get this done is to treat it like the DMV, and before you get the wrong idea. Um, you know, you can't drive a car in this country unless you pass a test, and you can't drive it further in life unless you at least pass a written test, just to say I still know the basic tenets of driving the space of responsibilities. 
And honestly, one of the only ways you can probably get financial literacy, because it's not happening in the schools and it won't happen fast enough, is to force Americans to understand certain principles of how to protect themselves. And it's not really that crazy of an idea because we will all buy into that because we want to be on the streets with other people that are supposed to be safe. And likewise, it would be better to be in a world where people at least understand how to protect themselves and how to actually take advantage of some of the opportunities that financial literacy will provide. So I'm all in with you on that. I just think we're going to need a bold answer, a very significant solution that we haven't found yet. Uh, I, I might, uh, if financial literacy has been uh, the um, single most important uh, charitable type of activity that Visa has engaged in over 25 years. We, uh, we have financial literacy programs which we distribute through over 30 state boards of education. Uh, the financial football, which is the theme under which it is taught, is required uh, in every school in a number of states in the United States. We've created financial soccer uh, in several different languages, which we've rolled out in, uh, in Latin America and uh, in Asia. Uh, these are games that people play at different levels and they learn how to manage uh, their finances through, uh, through playing the game. It may sound uh, simple, but it's, a, it's an extremely uh, compelling thing that has been extraordinarily well embraced by um, by the Fed, by state boards of education, and by several uh, foreign countries. We're extraordinarily concerned about it, and for me to explain to you the whole depth and breadth of the, uh, of the, um, of the program uh, would take too long tonight, but if you're interested and you want to inquire somewhere, we can provide you with data of, about what we do uh, in the United States and around uh, the rest of the world. Uh, we are heavy contributors to Teach for America and Teach for All. Teach for All is an international organization founded by Wendy Kopp, who founded Teach for America. It is an umbrella organization that has brought the environment up in, uh, I think, uh, now 14 different countries in the last three years. I am the chairman of Teach for All. Uh, so, organizationally, from senior management uh, all the way down, uh, Visa is extraordinarily concerned with financial literacy, and we feel strongly that financial literacy is important uh, to individuals. It's socially important. We also think it's important to our business. Yes. Yes. Uh, we were talking a lot about, it's over to your left from there we go. Why, why did I look to my left? Did you see it? Yes. I looked to my I left. Because my left or your left? Who's left? Yours. I looked to my left before because the guy that started or helped uh, r that runs the financial literacy environment for Visa is standing uh, over in the corner. <laughs> and I knew that he was smiling when somebody asked that question. And as a matter of fact, I'm sure he planted the question. <laughs> He's probably going to grade your answer when you get back there. Probably. So we'll see That's how right. you did. It was mostly right. So we've talked a lot about the regulations and, and in the banking industry over the last 20 years, whether it was the savings and loan or the changes in interstate banking in the late 90s or the modifications in Glass-Steagall in the early 2000s, regulations played some favorable and some unfavorable roles in the financial industry. So you, you had noted that there was smacking of favoritism with some of the recent regulations that are getting passed through with the Frank Dodd, but the question I had when, is when it's favorable in like 2008 when we had Congress coming in and providing, a, you know, modifying the capitalist instincts of the markets where they did in fact pick winners and losers that did favor large banks. Were you in favor of those actions or not at the time? Or were the capitalist instincts still there? Can I go first? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, have that. Um, Good question, and your facts are good. Um, but I think we might disagree on First of all, most banks that failed were the largest ones. Washington Mutual, National City, Wachovia. There wasn't a large, small issue here. And, and I, for one, since you asked so uh, bluntly, I'm going to be blunt, you know, we didn't allow Darwin to play, play his hand on this one. It was remarkable how the government protected some of the poor performers and allowed the mediocrity to persist. And they're out there still. 
and they're creating unreasonable uh, competitive environments, and they're hurting people again, telling them to do things they shouldn't be able to do. The non-bank environment is bigger. It's twice as big financially as the banking environment, which is regulated. And unless and until we get regulation for the non-banks, which hasn't started until the director of the Consumer Protection Bureau was finally appointed, which hasn't happened yet, we're going to be way outside of the level playing field. So I, for one, think we should have let more companies fail. I think they would have been better in the hands of those who proved themselves when they weren't doing things wrong when they could have. And I think we ought to do a very, very aggressive job now of making sure that the non-banks are ring-fenced under the same regulations so that people can't move from one place to another and once again be harmed by not knowing and unwittingly being untrained and educated on what's happening in their lives. So I think it was well intended. I think they didn't go far enough. And I would welcome that continued kind of level playing field that we haven't seen yet. I, I, I agree with him uh, totally, uh, but, uh, but in addition to that, when I talked about regulation, I didn't say that no regulation was required. I, I referred to over-regulation and I referred to, and I referred to, the, re, to the reactions. You know, something, something happened uh, in this country a couple of years ago, and that is when we got into a financial crisis, it was politically exple expedient to find a villain in the banking industry, and I'm the banker. <laughs> Period. <laughs> and the banking Good industry, sound effects, Joe. and the ba banking industry was picked a a a as the villain, and there was there was not much effort as some of this regulation was put together to ask the people that were involved in it if they had anything to add that might help the future environment. And so I, I, I don't think that anybody would say, or I certainly wouldn't say, uh, that regulations that control certain things, as a matter of fact, I, I think that I mentioned as it related to the CARD Act that there certainly was a good part of that act that was required. There were abuses and those abuses Great. should have been corrected. Uh, I, I, I also believe that I, I mentioned that I think sometimes when people try to correct things, they try to punish the people who they're correcting. And well, that may or may not be deserved, and in a lot of cases it, it, ra it, it tends to wrap in everybody and it can often become counterproductive. So we'll take one last audience question. Hi. Way up at the top here. Wow. Way up there. Wait, up, don't jump. <laughs> yeah. In the very back row, just like in college. Um, now, as a as an employee of U.S. Bank, I, I hear you know all the time that we. Well, then really don't jump. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like the idea that you know we stay conservative with our lending practices and only do prudent uh, you know, prudent loans and other stuff like that. And I heard you mention, Mr. Davis, in the video. Um, that you know, our idea is to rebuild the trust, uh, rebuild consumer trust, and that's how we really improve the banking industry the most and how we grow the most. But how do we do something that's tangible to rebuild that consumer trust and see that through to grow our company? Well, um, you just hit it. Let me explain how challenging this is. Um, oh, sorry, my bad. Um, there, it's a trend. That is the number one issue we're working on. Because remember, it's the first thing I answered in our question was reputation rebuilding. And just for a minute, switch place with me, all of you, and just realize the one thing we could do to make everyone happy is make more loans. And three years into a recession, the one thing we shouldn't do right now is to make more loans. Not by number. Just make all the loans to the people who need it and deserve it and are qualified. But sadly, there are less people qualified than there were companies qualified than there were a few years ago. So this is a classic dilemma. This is the catch-22 that the movie wasn't written for. This is a very, very difficult time. So instead, since we can't do that, we won't do that, because it would be next generation's problem. We're spending our next round of energies rebuilding our reputation inside the Beltway, which is the nomenclature for Washington, D.C. And I know that sounds so unbelievably basic, but the barbell is this. We're going to spend time in Washington, D.C., more time, period. We're going to spend more time working on messaging to the legislators, as I spoke earlier, go and see them more often, talk about we're actually good people. If you knew the kind of community service, the hours and the money that banks have given over the course of 150 years, there's no industry anywhere in America that can even come close. We have 2.4 million employees who are all very good people doing really good things. But we haven't told that story very well. So inside the Beltway, 
and over here with 2.4 million employees starting to rebuild their honest belief and trust in what they do. Somewhere along the way, we'll bring in the, the public through the customers who say, you know what, this bank did do well by me. I did do the right thing. And others will come in and say they didn't give me what I asked for because if they had, they would have hurt me. And clearly, they had my best interest at heart. So this is a very slow journey, a very torturous and very well-planned trip that we're just starting. Because it can't be the thing people want us to do because it would be the very thing we shouldn't. So we've got to go build it on the backs of 150 years of doing right, not 15 months of not doing right. And that's what we're going to start. And by the grace of a lot of good luck, we'll hopefully be here in a couple of years having accomplished at least that. I'm looking to the sky like I'm looking to God with that hope that it will happen. Oh, my God. You know, I might add to what he said, another lesson learned in the last few years that we learn, that everybody learns over and over and over again, is that credibility and trust are often easily given, but once lost, are almost impossible to regain. That's profound, Joe. Thank that you. Profound. And it's ubiquitous. That was music that should have followed that last line. How are we done? Cause and he got in the last use of ubiquitous as well. I think so. I got close. So. Can, I, can I make a comment? I, I, I don't want to, uh, I am currying favor with the audience, but I mean it. Those of you that are either grad students or recent grad, graduates, raise your hand. You're all hired. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you something. That is the most noble thing you've done with your life to point. You have taken the time to invest in yourself and invest in an education. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm speaking for Joe, I know this. Companies are different, and they're going to be different. And we're going to welcome you into our organizations to use your mind and to provide change and to change the world. One thing about this downturn, it's caused all of us to realize that the answer to this isn't going to be doing what we did in the past or doing it harder or faster. It's going to be doing it differently. And I got to tell you, I'm so proud of the school here. I'm so proud of your new ranking. I'm so proud to have graduates in my family. In this great community and across the, 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 the country, this DU organization and what you've all built is an amazing success. And you should be very, very proud. You can take that anywhere, and it will carry a great deal of heft. And I want you to not go into organizations and feel a suffocation. All this great learning, all this great theory you went through, and then get somewhere real and find out you can't use it. Challenge us. Make us find you and make sure that you have a voice. Because honestly, I've learned nothing better in the last three years than our company is going to be crafted by people way smarter than me, who are more talented and more educated, who have a view of things that I don't have to help us figure out a new future. Because what we have to do is be where we need to be five years from now and start today not figure out where we are today and guess where we want to be later. So what you've done is quite impressive. The rest of us are, I, I am in awe of you because I barely got my bachelor's degree and I'm just so impressed with the audience that's here tonight. So I want to thank you for that and you work at a great school and you're lucky to have her, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Is, I'll pay you later. Is, is that, is that the way you wanted me to say it? Yeah, exactly. You missed a few words, but I think you got it pretty right. And you're a grad, so you, uh, I, I can talk about it, because I'm not from here. So I'm not saying anything. Go Cal State Fullerton. Huh? So, what was that? Whatever. Edit that out of the it's film, It's not a okay. threat to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, these interviews that I've been doing with executives from around the country really um, highlight three of the points that they made tonight, and I think are really important to take away. One is really the power of the relationships. I've heard time and time again that you can't wait until you need something to build the relationships, that you have to cultivate them now, and you have to cultivate different relationships than we've had in the past. Just as you mentioned going to Washington, D.C. and getting to know your legislators prior to the need for them, you have to start building all of, all of the relationships that you might need as you think about how you're going to move your business forward. I think second, and as importantly, is the, the idea of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. I think the, the quote that sums this up the best for me is you can't solve problems that have been created using the same kind of thinking that you used when you created them. And so we need people who are thinking differently about the world of business today, how we're going to solve the financial services crisis, how we're going to solve the trust crisis to really help us move forward. And I think third and most importantly that I've heard from all the executives and I think was clear in your message is we do have to focus on trust, we have to focus on ethics, and that has to be at the top of everything that we do every single day. Let's give both of these guys a round of applause Thank for you. spending some time with us. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe.
So I personally think we're very fortunate to have both of you as thought leaders in this industry and help us think about the way that we are going to do business differently. And I have to say this, and he's probably going to kill me, and I didn't say it beforehand, but doesn't he look like Rodney Dangerfield? <laughs> I'm told me that all the time. Yeah. So on uh, behalf of the... <laughs> hmm? I'll be back in he's a few years. <laughs> Well, that's why he was banging his mic. He was trying to get a joke out of you. So again, on behalf of the University of Denver, the Daniels College of Business, thanks both of you for being here. For the rest of you, we look forward to having you back here in October for our next series. We do have a reception out in the lobby. And again, thank you for being part of Voices of Experience. Thank you.